this time we'll move into um, um, the topic of breaks. And here we've got um, um, two papers in this session, which will cover the, the theme. Um, the first paper would be uh, presented by David Cooper, who will discuss brake failures on lifts. Um, let me briefly, it's my pleasure to introduce David, uh, which a lot of us know. Um, uh, David Cooper is um, the managing director of uh, UK-based lift consultancy, Lex UK. Um, David has been in the lift and escalator industry since 1980, as a very well-known author and speaker. He holds master and MPhil um, degrees from the University of Northampton, and he's also a visiting professor at the university. So thank you very much. David, over to you. Lovely, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we do. Lovely, thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think the to start on, the, on this paper is to discuss the reason uh, why I was interested in it. There's a view by some in the lift industry that the adjustments of brakes is no longer a requirement as they come out of the factory preset and their main function is now holding the lift at the floor rather than stopping it. I do not subscribe to this opinion. Having investigated numerous brake failures over the years, including some associated with variable frequency drives. It's true to say that brake failures were more prevalent in the days when the brake was used to stop the lift by way of friction between the pads and its associated drum. So the days of single speed uh, and two speed drives. In many ways, the old method of stopping using friction is similar to a modern lift having issues, which we often see, such as high speed lock tips where contact between the brake pads and drum occur to bring the lift car to a stop. This paper demonstrates a number of causes of brake failure, as well as the potential outcomes. Um, that's not moving forward, ah, oh, there we go. This new newspaper article, uh, which I found on the internet and a, a case that I was involved in, um, dates from 2010 and demonstrates that a brake on a variable frequency drive system can fail. In this instance, the lift had been running with the brake not lifting due to the buildup of carbon dust in the brake contactor. In addition, the brake was a dual solenoid type, but had been wired in series such that it was effectively a single coil. When the lift was pulled to the upper floors of the building, the variable frequency drive was able to drive through the stored brake. And this became easier as the pads became hotter and less effective. And also the dynamic transfer of mass with the counterweight side getting heavier as the car ascended and the ropes paid out on the counterweight side. The lift had been giving clues that it was in trouble, including a buildup of dust inside the control panel and leveling problems at floors. But on the fateful day, the brake was finally overcome, and despite bringing the lift car to a stop, the lift then rolled upwards as a passenger was entering the car. The lady sustained fatal injuries as a result of the incident, having become trapped between the car threshold and the landing door header. There are many ways that a brake can fail, and these include electrically and mechanically. For instance, brake solenoid going open circuit on a single solenoid, brake solenoid going open circuit on a twin polarized, polarized type, physical wear of the brake pad itself, rivets coming loose on older brake pad designs, lubricant on the brake pad, which may have stemmed from, a, from a, an oil leak at the gearbox itself. It can also become stuck in the open position after the use of a, uh, of, um, a brake release. It can also become stuck in the open position just due to a single line failure. Uh, and I'll give an example of one of these um, shortly. Um, it's also been known that um, a brake can be held in the open position due to residual magnetism. The system could be overloaded and the brake unable to hold, hold the load. Poor adjustment of the brake is an obvious cause as well as overheating. All of these defects can occur in newer lifts as well as older ones. EN 8180, which of course is the standard uh, entitled Improvement of Safety of Existing Lifts, was republished in 2019 from its original 2003 version. 
in there, there are two clauses uh, which uh, have been introduced. 8.1 identifies breaks with only one set. And 10.1 identifies no earth fault protection as being potentially hazardous. It's been known for brakes not to lift fully due to an earth fault taking away some of the current. The LEA guidance, this is the older LEA, gu LEA guidance, I might add, um, on the 2003 version of EN 8180, identifies the issues of poor levelling as potentially hazardous, especially on older drive systems such as single and two speed, where reliance is placed on the brake completely for levelling. Of course, the levelling offers up a risk of tripping due to the outer level condition between the lift car and the landing itself, but it can also be symptomatic of problems with the brake, albeit levelling leveling on systems where a brake is used for stopping and, and, and holding rather than just holding can be affected by a number of factors. These factors include the brake condition itself and associated adjustment, the position of the lift car in the shaft uh, affecting the balance, and the mass itself that's within the lift car. To give you a couple of examples now, um, this is a, a safety notice issued by Otis. A number of technical information notices have been issued by the industry over the years, warning of potential brake failures. This one came around as a result of brake failures following wear at the brake plunger. Um, the rod itself mushroomed um, causing an increase in diameter and thus allowing the brake to remain open after it had operated. In such a case, the relationship between the car and the counterweight obviously dictates the way the lift car will roll. But wherever this happens, if there is a passenger or passengers in the lift car, it will be frightening for the passenger, especially if the car doors are open, as has happened in some cases. In this event, the lift is likely to increase its speed as the suspension ropes pay out on the heaviest side of the car to count the weight um, equation. This is a, a, a technical information bulletin issued by Dewhursts. Um, it relates to split pins failing on brakes where the magnetic plate needs to be retained in position and work hardening of the, the split pin as the plate um, um, was pushed against, against it during every operation. Many of these brakes still exist out there, but, but some still utilizing the old, old single or two speed drive system. But also where lifts have been modernized with a new control panel, but the gearbox motor and brake have been retained as it was considered there was more serviceable life left in them. So before I hand over to Lutvi to talk about escalator brakes, in conclusion, brake failures can still occur whether the brake is an older design or even a newer one. And just because they are new is not a reason not to check them as part of the routine maintenance. Older lifts with single line components in the braking system need to be assessed. It is recommended that all brakes should be fitted with lift detection switches. Where modernization takes place and an older style brake is retained and a variable frequency drive is fitted to replace an older system, such as single or two speed, there's a real risk that the lift can, can drive through the closed brake. Prevention is better than cure, and methods of detecting the, the depletion of braking efficiency should be developed so as to detect rather than respond to a failure. The potential for uncontrolled movement should be detected before it actually happens. By this, I mean brake switches. Check-in of brake condition adjustment is still an essential part, in my opinion, of the maintenance regime, as extraneous situations such as high-speed lock tipping um, uh, power cuts and so on can still affect braking performance. And also, just because they are difficult to get to on, on MRLs is not a valid reason not to check their condition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, thanks a lot. Right on time, but we are we have time with we have time for one question before we hand this over to, to Lutfi. Um, I have an advanced question here, just on, now on chat, um, uh, about improvements. Uh, I think that uh, question could fit very well on, into the next theme of, the, of our conference, which is modernization, basically replacing older types. So the, the, the question is, the conclusion include improvement measures essentially to replace older types with newer brake systems. 
What can be done to encourage the upgrade? In briefly. A very good question. I think the um, for me, um, it, it comes to to the sales engineers in, in our in our industry. Uh, they need to be aware of situations like this and, and need to need to be promoting Ian eighty one eighty and and what's in standards. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of my big bugbears is that um, teaching of standards isn't getting to the coalface in our industry, in particular with BS7255 and safe working on lifts. Thank you, Dave. That, that's excellent. Thanks very much for a very interesting paper. So um, let's move on. Um, the, the, the final paper for this uh, session will be presented by uh, Professor Lutfi Al-Sharif. Uh, the paper is entitled uh, Two Mode two modes of failure of escalator braking system. So this breaks now in escalators. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Professor Lutfi Al-Sharif, who is currently the Dean of Engineering Technology and Professor of Electrical Engineering at Al Hussein Technological University in Amman, in Jordan. And he's also Professor of Building Transportation Systems at the Department of Mechatronics Engineering at the University of Jordan. Um, thank you, Lutfi, for being with us, and um, over to you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, hello to everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Is there, is there, yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, um, I'll, hopefully, I wouldn't be very long. I, I just wanted to, um, to try to summarize what I believe are the two most important modes of failure in escalator braking systems. Um, so, um, uh, I'm going to show you an interesting slide which shows actually how an escalator stops and slows down under the influence of a brake. Um, I'll, talk, I'll, say, I'll state what these two failure modes are. Um, we've talked before, I think in a previous symposium, I talked about runaway escalators. Um, I'll talk a bit about uh, an easy met method by which uh, an escalator can be checked non-invasively. Um, and I'll just mention intelligent braking systems. So uh, the, the sequence of, of an escalator stop uh, is a stop switch is pressed or a safety device trips. There's, what you probably don't realize is that actually there's an electrical de delay due to tripping of the contactor that takes time. And that time is important, 40 milliseconds. There's mechanical delay before the mechanical brake physically moves and starts touching the pad or the disc. Uh, then th this causes mechanical delay. There's actually a slowing down of the escalator and then fully stopping. So this is actually a, uh, an interesting slide. Uh, it actually, this takes something like four or five hours to get the data and produce, but it, it actually allows you to understand what happens when an escalator stops. So a stop switch, you can see my pointer, St Stefan, can you see my, the, the arrow is, 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 uh, is showing, you can see I'm moving it around. Yes, we can, we can see it. So this that's, is that's good, yes. Well, this is when the stop switch was pressed, time zero. There was in this escalator, not in every escalator, there was around the 350 millisecond delay until the contactor trips and so on. There's mechanical delay by which the mechanical brake starts moving and touching the pads. The torque develops fully at this point, and then the escalator comes to a stop. And you can see all these details are quite important in what happens within, within a stop. If the brakes didn't apply and the escalator was unloaded, this is actually what would happen. It would take much longer. So this is speed, escalator speed, against time. And, and understanding this anatomy is very important, understanding actually how an escalator stops under a conventional braking system. So to summarize the two failure modes, what I've summarized, now you could argue that there are much smaller failures, but I think if you look at it at the end of it, you either have too much braking or you have too little braking, basically. I mean, and, and regardless of what the reasons are, the, the escalator might be uh, stopped so, uh, so um, um, uh, harshly that it's actually causing passengers to fall off, or it's actually ha has very, very little braking and the escalator runs away. Um, and so the first scenario leads to passenger falls. The other one is actually when the brake is, is so badly adjusted that actually it doesn't, it, it doesn't do anything. So when it's needed, it doesn't actually slow down the escalator. We talked about runaway escalators. What you can, what's important about this curve, this is showing how the escalator has stopped under zero load, 50% load, 75% load, and 100% load. And the important point in this graph is, you can see when it's under 100% load, it's starting to run away until the brake comes in and slows it down. So if brake doesn't come in and slow it down, you will have a runaway, runaway situation. So 
So, uh, and, and I've mentioned, you can find them all in the paper. There's actually quite a large number of runaway incidents. One of the first one that attracted my attention is back in 1989, um, Toronto CN Tower. And then there are so many others. Um, I've actually, I don't have any more recent ones. David is probably a better person to, but uh, you, can, you can see a lot of them actually uh, listed in the paper. So these are the two. Now there is actually currently a mathematical model which has been published. Uh, which relies on the anatomy we discussed. And this mathematical model can be used without actually loading the escalator. You can test the escalator with no load, and then you can predict based on this graph, which is the delay, the mechanical delay, and the stopping. And if you add all of these areas, you get the stopping distance. So you can predict non-invasively the stopping distance of an escalator in situ without actually having to uh, put any weights on it. And this will allow you to um, in, under maintenance, periodically ch check the, the status of the braking system and make sure that it's actually working correctly. And this is an example of a, a paper I presented some time ago about a number of escalators in a, in a system, and it recommends the different values or the different settings that are needed in order to ensure that the escalator can uh, achieve what, it, what the braking requirements. The, the intelligent braking systems, I think, are a, a solution, a, a future solution to both of these problems, if they are set up correctly. And you can see what's, what's beautiful about the intelligent braking system, electrical braking system, is under different loads from 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, you get exactly the same stopping curve. There's no variation between uh, the different loads. So to conclude, um, the two main failure modes for an escalator, basically in, 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 lay, in lay person's language, are too little braking and too much braking. So stopping too harshly could lead to a passenger fall. And, and the, the, uh, the 2008 version of EN115 uh, explicitly stated this as uh, the, the, the maximum deceleration in the direction of travel must be less than or equal to one meter per second square. And it actually devised the suitable filter for filtering that to remove any noise. So in the 2008 version, there was actually a new requirement that looked at acceleration or deceleration and not just the stopping distance, what it did before. So before 2008, it was stopping distance. After 2008, EN105, 2008, it became stopping distance and um, deceleration, maximum deceleration. Um, lack of any braking effort, which is very badly adjusted, would lead to runaway situations. And this is the other, the other scenario. And both can be checked non-invasively uh, by just checking uh, a no-load acceleration. The recommendation for any, uh, anyone who's, who's responsible for maintenance of escalators is to have a six-monthly check. The six-monthly check must not just simply check the, the stopping distance. It must also check the stopping deceleration and use a mathematical model to deduce uh, whether the escalator is within the requirements of the N105 or not. So, um, um, intelligent braking systems are a good solution for this. It will address both failure um, If you allow me, Stefan, I just want, uh, my time is up, I just want 10 or 20 seconds just to talk about this. If you examine the, the two failure modes, you would see this is actually the famous Venn diagram um, causes of passenger accidents in, es in escalators. And you can see that um, mainly, I think we, we're falling with these two accidents with bad maintenance. Maybe some of it is caused by design or could be removed by design. But in fact, a lot of it is actually within maintenance and inspection. If we can, by design, remove the need for, um, or remove the, the risk of failure by lack of maintenance, and that's good, obviously. And intelligent braking systems would probably fall into that category. If we can actually design the escalator from day one with a good intelligent braking system, we probably start reducing the risk from lack of maintenance uh, or, or poor maintenance. So um, passenger behavior does contribute in this case, but it's actually minim minimal. It's not holding onto the handrail and, and so on. Um, I like this. I'm just going to end with this. This is actually what is called the band brake um, on a public service escalator. And a band brake only operates in the down direction because the analogy is with the oil filter ratchet. If you've seen um, an oil fil filter ratchet, it will only work in one direction. To move it in the opposite direction, you need to take it off, uh, reverse it, and then put it on. Thank you much for your attention. This brings me to the end of my uh, presentation.